So welcome to the inaugural event of the Harriman Institute project on human rights in the post-communist world strategies and outcomes. So the post-communist uh, region is one that has uh, undergone uh, experiences uh, that provide uh, lessons about strategies for promoting human rights. Uh, part of the post-communist world has human rights flourishing to a degree that uh, it never has before, but in other parts of the post-communist world, human rights are under uh, serious attack. So this gives us uh, a broad range of variation and outcomes to think about well, what causes uh, these differences in outcomes and to what extent are those differences caused by different strategies of people who want to promote uh, human rights. Uh, so especially in the project which is uh, co-organized uh, by Alexander Cooley, a professor at uh, Barnard College Political Science Department and myself, uh, we're looking at uh, what strategies uh, of rights promotion are effective. What are the theories of change underlying the strategies of rights promotion uh, that uh, underpin and guide these approaches? Uh, what are the variation of outcomes and uh, compliance with rights standards and how were they measured by um, the various organizations like Freedom House or Transparency International, uh, what have you, that have devised uh, techniques for measuring these outcomes. Uh, and what are the consequences of the booming cottage industry of these rating and ranking uh, organizations in the areas of democracy, corruption, legality, and so forth. So in the project, we're going to start with a few presentations that look at the big picture, theories of change in a global and comparative context, including our session tonight with Catherine Sickink. And then in the course of uh, the year, we're going to move on to more events that are very specifically about the post-communist world that will be evaluated in the light of these concepts that we're going to be starting to grapple with uh, tonight. So uh, tonight and a week from tonight, we have two of the most high-profile and rigorous thinkers in the area of human rights strategies and evaluation of their success. Tonight we have Catherine Sickink, who's a professor in the political science department at the University of Minnesota. She's the book, of, uh, the author of the very famous book, Activists Beyond Borders, uh, which uh, together with her other work I think it's fair to say basically created the modern field of human rights studies in the discipline of political science and uh, has won prestigious awards such as the Gravemeyer Award uh, for World Order. And now she's completing a new book that uses some of the approaches she developed earlier in her award-winning book uh, applying it to the question of international criminal justice, the book The Justice Cascade, which will be appearing uh, next summer from Norton Books, and which you'll get a preview of uh, tonight. Um, we're especially proud of Catherine here at Columbia because she's a Columbia PhD. So always uh, great to have her back, and we can uh, take credit and bask in her glory. Uh, just a little advertisement for next week. Uh, Beth Simmons, who's a professor in the government department at Harvard, will be giving a talk on uh, her award-winning book uh, on October 20th at 5.30. Different venue. It's going to be in 1501 International Affairs Building. Uh, and she's going to be talking about mobilizing for human rights. Her discussants will be Ken Roth, the president of Human Rights Watch, and Alex Cooley. So tonight, Catherine's going to talk for uh, about 35 minutes. And we have two excellent uh, discussants 
Uh, Richard Dicker is here, the director of the Human Rights Watch International Justice Program. And uh, our other discussant is uh, Robert Cohan, who's a professor of public and international affairs at uh, Princeton University, uh, past president of the American Political Science Association, and uh, uh, the, uh, the winner of the poll for who's the most influential uh, scholar of international relations, like year in and uh, year out. So. Um, we're happy to, to have these two discussants because one of our objectives in this series is to get a good dialogue going between academics and practitioners on these issues of human rights uh, strategies. And so, uh, you know, let it begin uh, tonight. Now, one other advertisement uh, before I let Catherine uh, take the floor, which is that if you're interested in transitional justice as a topic, uh, we have another great panel for you coming up on February 10th. 515 in 1501 International Affairs building that day, where we're going to hear from four scholars who have new book projects on transitional justice in Eastern Europe and elsewhere. Uh, Laura Nettlefield, who is uh, one of the fellows in our project this year and who's here, raise your hand, Laura. Uh, Ruti Titel, who invented the term transitional justice. Um, Monica Nalepa uh, and Leslie Vinjamori will present their research and their discussants will be Arie Nair, the founder of Human Rights Watch and the president of the Open Society Institute, and Tina Rosenberg, who won the National Book Award for her book on the subject. Uh, so um, February 10th, you transitional justice aficionados, don't, don't miss that one. So. Now, Catherine, uh, please tell us about your exciting new book. Well, first, thank you very much, Jack, for, uh, for arranging this event and for the gracious over-the-top introduction. Um, it's really a pleasure for me to, it's always a pleasure for me to be back here at Columbia University. Um, I want to have special thanks to Richard Dicker and to Robert Cohane for uh, agreeing to come, for taking the time to read the manuscript, the whole manuscript, and, to, and, and come today to comment on it. And uh, I, in fact, am completing my revisions for Norton at the end of October, so I'm exactly at the point where I can take advantage of last minute uh, suggestions and, and, and comments. Uh, so I welcome those of the commentators and also uh, the audience. Um, this book, I'm actually uh, trying to write it simultaneously for an academic audience and for the general public. Uh, and I, that, I think, is clear to the people who read the manuscript. It won't be so clear today in my presentation. Uh, but I tell a lot of uh, stories of the real people behind the Justice Cascade uh, in this book. Um, the basic focus is that over the last three decades, countries are increasingly using criminal trials to hold past state officials accountable for human rights violations. Um, and I argued quite a few years ago with my colleague Ellen Lutz that this was an important and new phenomenon in international politics, and we called it the Justice Cascade. Uh, and that's the term I'm now using uh, for this book. And by the Justice Cascade, we didn't mean that true justice was being done everywhere in the world. So let me first, uh, I know the opposition always comes saying, but true justice has not been done, so you are wrong. There's no Justice Cascade. I'm using that term from uh, legal theorist Cass Sunstein, who developed the term a norm cascade by which he meant that there was a new legitimacy, that there's new legitimacy to norms, and in this case, norms around individual criminal accountability, uh, which we see through the increasing use of criminal prosecutions at the international, domestic, and foreign level. Now, the, um, the research questions for the book then are why, why this new trend? Why are state officials being held accountable for human rights violations through criminal prosecutions when that did not happen before? What effects do these prosecutions have? Um, and in particular, can human rights trials uh, reduce human rights violations? We presume that's the main purpose 
of such prosecutions is prevention, and the question is, uh, or deterrence. Do they have a deterrent effect? Um, and then finally, can this case help us think about important theoretical debates in uh, uh, the social sciences about norm emergence, norm diffusion, compliance with international law, deterrence of international crime, and of course the big question that Jack introduced, how do we explain change in international politics? Now, question number one really is, has two separate questions, and that is how do these new, does this new trend first emerge? How do those first countries that carry out prosecutions decide to do it when it hasn't been done before? And then, uh, you know, um, how do these, um, uh, you know, why and how do these practices spread or diffuse? And I really realized after working on the book for a while that those are two quite different questions that require different uh, explanations. Um, just to give you an idea of, the, con of the, the contents, the table of contents of the book is organized around these three questions. What, uh, how do we create, uh, how, do, how does the trend towards individual criminal accountability emerge? Um, how do these ideas spread? And then finally, uh, do human rights prosecutions make a difference? Can, do they have an impact? And you'll note that that section of the book has three separate uh, chapters. One looks at the impact in Latin America, where I've done a lot of work and which has been the, the earliest and, and most frequent user of, of these kinds of prosecutions. The second reports on a study I've done with a colleague, Han Jun Kim, which is a statistical, global statistical analysis of the impact of prosecutions around the world. And the third takes up the important case of the United States. Because as soon as you say, oh, there's a new norm out there, people ask the important and obvious question. Well, if there's really a new norm, does it have an impact for powerful states in the world? Uh, what difference does it make for the United States or for China or for the Soviet Union and Chechnya, for example? And um, so I take up the case specifically looking at uh, Bush administration non-compliance with uh, torture, uh, with the prohibition of torture, non-compliance with the prohibition of torture, and I ask what difference, if any, did the uh, justice cascade have for Bush administration policy? Now, I'm not going to talk about that during my presentation today because I'm going to rush you through this whole book, uh, but I would be very happy to uh, field uh, questions about that during the uh, question and answer period. Um, now, the, um, the, the historical argument I'm making is that there's three models of accountability. And I'm taking a definition of accountability from Robert Cohane and, and Ruth Grant's um, very well-known article on that topic uh, that says that um, the definition is that some uh, actors have the right to hold other actors to uh, account. And they do it through a variety of means. And legal accountability is not the only form of accountability. Uh, I'm nevertheless arguing that prior to World War II, um, there was something I call the sovereign immunity model, and that's simply that state and state officials were not held accountable uh, for human, past human rights violations. There are a few exceptions to that rule, but it, I, it's mainly the rule. Uh, after World War II and largely in response to the failure of the sovereign immunity model to prevent the Holocaust and other human rights violations during the war, the, uh, something. Uh, I call the state accountability model emerged. This is virtually the entire United Nations system works around a state accountability model, as do the regional human rights courts in the Americas or in Europe, where if the European Court of Human Rights finds that a state is not meeting its obligations under the European Convention, it asks that state to change its policy or to provide redress. Um, and so the state itself is held accountable, but individuals are not. And then thirdly, uh, and the topic of my book, of course, is the individual criminal accountability model begins to emerge in the 70s and the 80s, where for the first time individual state officials are held legally accountable. Now the argument here is not that uh, the criminal model is replacing or supplanting these other models. Rather, they continue to exist side by side. Am I too close to this mic? Is that what's giving us the feedback? Okay. Um, they continue to, to exist side by side. So basically in the, in the world today I would argue we have all three of these models continue to exist and function together. Um, but what is new is in, in the 
the three decades is the emergence of this criminal account, individual criminal accountability model. Now, to write the book, we decided to produce a database because there were a lot of big arguments about this, these issues. And they were being debated mainly on the basis of case studies, individual case studies. And so we created a database of human rights prosecutions in the world. I just want to briefly give you an overview of that database. Um, first, it's a database of prosecutions at three levels. International prosecutions, uh, like the uh, ICC, the International Criminal Court, the ICTY, foreign or transnational prosecutions, uh, and the most famous of those being the prosecution of uh, Pinochet in the United Kingdom uh, for crimes committed in Chile, and then finally domestic prosecutions. Um, international legal scholars, international relations scholars have paid the most attention to the international prosecution part of this story, but when you see the database, you'll see that most of the action is actually occurring in domestic courts. Excellent books have been written on, on each of these topics. You know, Laura Nettlefield's book about the ICTY, you're going to hear about in February, for example. Uh, books about the ICC, books about single sets of trials in Argentina. What's been missing, I believe, is the big picture, that there is the emergence of a decentralized but interactive system of accountability that involving prosecutions at all three levels. Um, so this is just a brief summary of the, the, the data in the database. These are the numbers, annual numbers of uh, prosecution years. You see we have here the foreign, the international, the domestic, and then the total. And then here is a cumulative prosecution years by types. And I think this then makes evident kind of what I'm, we mean when we say that there's a cascade of sorts here, uh, this dramatic increase, and also the dark the, the dark black uh, is the domestic trials. So I also think it makes clear that a lot of the criminal prosecution is happening in domestic courts for crimes committed, in, human rights violations committed in that country. Uh, just one other interesting fact about the database about uh, pro domestic prosecutions is that it's very regionally uh, concentrated. So even though this is a global phenomena, because there are criminal prosecutions for human rights violations in all regions of the world, it has been concentrated in certain regions and especially in the Americas and in Central and Eastern Europe. Um, and uh, so because I originally worked on Latin America, uh, I started following this trend very early back in 1985. Actually, I was writing in Argentina, writing my dissertation on a totally different topic, and it was the year that the trials of the juntas were happening in, in Argentina, and I was able during that entire year to witness uh, some of the most important and, uh, and earliest trials of high-level officials for past human rights violations. Now, to turn to the first question, why does a justice cascade emerge? Um, basically, and uh, one of the things I found is that this regional pattern I just showed you is because the Justice Cascade emerged in regions where regional human rights law and institutions were already in place, especially Europe and the Americas. Um, so this is also, these are also the regions that experienced the early part of the third wave of democratization. The countries that adopted uh, early prosecutions were also places that had domestic and regional human rights networks that were strong. And so people who know my earlier work won't be surprised. Once again, some of the protagonists here are these human rights organizations, these human rights networks that push for uh, human rights prosecutions. Um, but once you have those in place, there are some countries that adopt prosecutions and some countries that don't. And one of the factors that's very important for early adopters of such prosecutions is that they had a ruptured uh, transition to democracy. And that's a term, compared to politics, folks use to, uh, about, talk about transitions to democracy. Usually it means that there was a, a, a war and, and the, the previous regime lost the war, like the Falklands or Malvinas War in Argentina. In the case of Greece, there was the military debacle in Cyprus. Um, and that in doing so, they weakened uh, their own power and were not able to 
uh, dictate the terms of the transition. They were not able to dictate terms that basically protected themselves from prosecution in the new regime. Uh, and countries that had pacted transitions, uh, the power holders were able to set the terms and were able to rule out prosecutions. And so that factor turns to be an important factor to predict early adopters of trials. So for example, this is why we get the earliest trials in Greece and in Portugal, both had ruptured transitions, not in Spain that had a transition in the same region around the same time, but did not have any prosecutions. It helps explain why we get prosecutions in Argentina and Bolivia, both with ruptured transitions, but not in countries like Uruguay or Brazil that had transitions around the same time, but did not initially use prosecutions. Um, and then the other factor that's very interesting, I think, about the conditions is once it became possible to imagine accountability. And what's hard to go back and remember, because we just take it for granted nowadays, of course, of course people will think about individual criminal accountability. But when I first interviewed human rights activists in Argentina, when did they first make that demand? Uh, one person told me, he goes, he remembers early meetings where he went to the gathering of human rights activists who are planning a demonstration and they're trying to decide whether they dare put the word justice in a banner, in, in a slogan. And he, and he suggests justice and his fellow activists say, are you crazy? Are you a provocateur? You know, we can't ask for justice. And yet only three years later in Argentina, the demand was juicio castigo a todos los culpables. Okay, justice and punishment for all the guilty. Okay, a maximalist human rights demand had happened. And so um, we sometimes forget that it was perceived as dangerous, risky demand. Uh, it was almost unimaginable for many, even for the victims, even for the activists, it was unimaginable that actually state officials could be held individually criminally accountable for human rights violations. And so what transformed was not just that these trials happened, but a whole transformation of the very imagination of what was possible. Um, and so when people began to think it might be possible to prosecute, they turn to a familiar domestic analogy. They turn to criminal law from their domestic legal system. Um, and, and norms, theorists have said that before. They said that domestic norms are uh, very often uh, used as, to think about norms in the international system. Uh, I think in this case that um, the, for lawyers, for judges, uh, for, or, for victims, it was once they thought it was possible to have accountability, the obvious solution seemed to be the criminal accountability system that they were already using in their domestic judicial system in virtually every country of the world. Um, so now this is my attempt at a, and, and Richard Dicker hasn't seen this one yet, so I want his reaction to it. Uh, and I don't think Bob has seen it either. This is my attempt to do a better visual for chapter four, for those of you who've read the book. And uh, it's also my attempt because um, chapter four is about the cascade itself, if you wish, how this idea takes off and spreads around the world. Um, and, uh, and Norton wanted me to take out the part about international uh, law. It's too much about drafting those boring treaties and no one will want to read this book. Uh, and so, I tr the argument that, um, that I discovered as I was looking at the spread of these ideas is there was not one justice cascade. There were various, to keep the water metaphor, streams that flowed into the justice cascade. Uh, and in particular, there were these two streams, one that came the international tribunal uh, stream that's coming along the top there, and there was a separate stream that were these domestic and foreign prosecutions I've been talking about. And initially those two streams didn't interact. And so if you ask an international lawyer or you ask someone who's worked at the ICTY or helped set up the ICTY and you say, what's the origin of the ICTY? And they say, Nuremberg. And that's all they say, Nuremberg, maybe Tokyo, maybe Eichmann, okay? But they don't mention ever the domestic trials. So they tell just this international story. Actually, Richard Dicker, is, well, I hope we'll tell a story later on, but initially, after Nuremberg, 
it wasn't, the, the first possible case wasn't going to be the former Yugoslavia. The first possible case might have been Iraq. And there was interest in seeing whether there could be a case brought against Iraq for the genocide of the Kurds that it failed. So the next international tribunal becomes the ICTY, the ICTR, and then eventually moves towards the ICC. Meanwhile, at the same time, uh, we have these uh, domestic prosecutions uh, moving ahead on this totally separate stream. Uh, and, but these two streams begin to converge, and they begin to converge at the Rome meeting to draft the statute of the International Criminal Court. And they converge because countries come to Rome uh, by about 30 countries by the time, uh, actually uh, maybe slightly more than that, come who have already practiced domestic prosecutions in their country. And they are present at Rome and that experience with domestic prosecutions informs their participation at Rome. Uh, so the, the streams begin to come together. But then finally at the bottom, uh, you see this part that Norton wants me to take out that I'm trying to justify. And the point is this. The point is that these, the, the, the critique of Nuremberg was that Nuremberg was victor's justice, that Nuremberg was retroactive justice. And so in order to make the justice cascade stick, in order to make it a permanent feature of the national system, you had to build hard law as its underpinning. And so, again, I use probably worn metaphor by this point, you had to build the stream bed, this hard law stream bed underneath the justice cascade, underneath these streams, in order to uh, give it this legal underpinning that would make it not victor's justice, not retroactive justice, uh, and to make it a more enduring feature of the international system. And that was done starting really uh, with the Genocide Convention and the um, Geneva Conventions, but it really took steam uh, in the uh, 80s with the drafting of the Convention Against Torture. And with the drafting of the Convention Against Torture, you have entering in finally what some people are calling the individualization of international law or the criminalization of international law. In other words, finally the individual really takes his or her place in international law. And, Previously, states had always been the privileged actors, international law individuals had not played an important role. And it's through very much the actions of penal lawyers, the association, here's an, a, a professional association, the association of penal lawyers that start working to get this language about individuals as objects and subjects of international law that begins to really appear in the torture convention. Um, so, Now, so this is actually trying to explain the argument about the, the, the main argument in the book, and the notion is that what we're, these streams are coming together, and that we, we, are, we have an emerging system of a decentralized, interactive system of global accountability. It's decentralized because decisions are being taken in many different places, mainly in domestic judicial systems by domestic judges and prosecutors who are not coordinating their decisions with others. It's interactive because the decision taking one place has an impact and interacts with decisions taking elsewhere. The most obvious, the clearest example of this for me is always the Pinochet case. Amnesty laws in Chile closed down the Chilean justice system to victims. They took the case to the United Kingdom. That led to the arrest of Pinochet in London. The, the, once Pinochet's arrest in London, the Chileans do everything possible to show that he can be tried back at home, and so judicial and political changes are made back in Chile so that domestic prosecutions can move ahead. That, I think, illustrates this interactive nature of, the, of these levels. The uh, criminal court, of course, embodies this interactivity in the doctrine of complementarity. Um, but I mean interactivity beyond complementarity. Rather, you might take the word complementarity and think of it as being a metaphor for the largest system, whether it's operating in relation to the ICC or not. Um, so under what conditions then does this model diffuse or spread? Uh, their background conditions include uh, the end of the Cold War and the third wave of democracy. So even though the spreading starts before the end of the Cold War, it really does take off in this period.
period, really, between the end of the Cold War and the beginning of the War on Terror. Um, the reigning orthodoxy, which is both the immunity and the state uh, accountability model, are increasingly seen as broken or failed. And this is very important in the context of the Balkans and Rwanda. So the appearance of genocide in the heart of Europe 50 years after the Holocaust, and closely followed by a terrible genocide in Africa, where the international community seems unable to respond, uh, are seen as a kind of shock that suggests the system is broken or failed in some way, and that we need some new elements to address it. And, and this gives a push to, uh, to individual criminal accountability as an additional tool in the tool case of uh, people concerned about justice. Now, some people initially said, oh, that was just, um, that, that was just guilt. There was so much guilt over failures that they were doing kind of a band-aid approach by setting up these tribunals. Um, but I think that ignores the degree to which this was real political action that could have real political consequences. Um, now, again, norm entrepreneurs actively work to diffuse this model. Diffusion is usually a passive verb. Things diffuse. But here, norm entrepreneurs diffuse these norms. Not just advocacy networks, but advocacy networks working together, especially with networks, transgovernmental networks in like-minded states. Um, and sometimes epistemic communities of legal professionals like these penal law folks. Um, and so the, uh, sometimes these transgovernmental networks included the United States, as in the creation of the ICTY, where the U.S. was an important player. Sometimes powerful states like, they, like the United States or China were adamantly opposed to these developments, like with the creation of the International Criminal Court. So this is what these transnational networks were not necessarily networks of powerful state imposing their norms or values on the rest of the world. Um, okay, I'm turning to question three. I want to make sure we have plenty of time for my commentators. So I'm rushing a bit, but hopefully we'll have time to come back to questions. Um, turning to, um, to uh, question three, what difference? What do these trials make? Are they effective? Are they not effective? To answer that question, first you have to say, what do you mean by effectiveness? And people trying to answer the question of the effectiveness of these tribunals have used many, many different criteria, have held these tribunals up to many uh, high goals, high and lofty goals. Um, I'm going to focus just really on one of these today, and that is the first, and that is do criminal, individual criminal prosecutions lead to improvements in human rights. Um, the, uh, there's a lot of theories out there about this in uh, political science. There's a couple of uh, pretty mainstream theories that suggest that um, unless a norm has enforcement, it's not going to have an effect. And I conceive of these kind of prosecutions as a form of enforcement. Um, the, uh, we know the human rights regime had lots of treaties and not many teeth. Finally, you've got some teeth through these prosecutions. Uh, and so people like uh, Downs and Rockney uh, and others would suggest that when you get enforcement, you're more likely to see uh, effectiveness. Um, there, this is also connects to deterrence theory in sociology, which is that an increase in the likelihood of punishment uh, should lead to a decrease in crime. Now, deterrence theory is very often, I think, um, erroneously only associated with severity of punishment. And, I, and so whenever I say this, I have to say, I know you've all heard about the death penalty. You're going to raise your hand and start saying, we all know the death penalty doesn't deter crime. The point I want to make to you is this. Deterrence theory involves two factors, the likelihood of punishment and the severity of punishment. And quantitative research on deterrence suggests that there is support that increases in the likelihood of punishment lead to a decrease in crime. There is not such support for notions about severity of punishment. And we might think of that when we debate issues about severity of sentences in these international tribunals. The victims care very deeply about severe sentences, 
but it's not clear that more severe sentences will deter crime. I think it, it, it's, it is an important hypothesis that the, a greater likelihood of punishment might deter crime. The international community was, if you wish, international environment was like a, a natural experiment for deterrence theory because the, under the impunity model, there was zero likelihood of punishment. If you were a state official, if you carried out human rights violations, you could anticipate a zero likelihood that you would be punished individually, criminally, for your activity. And in these uh, uh, 30 years, these last 30 years, we've moved from a zero likelihood of punishment to some positive sum, varies from country to country and varies from region to region. And so I think it's actually a very interesting uh, time to ask about the relevance of deterrence theory. There's other theories that predict a negative effect uh, of trials. Um, so uh, democratization theory has long said that, you know, really worries that s prosecutions are going to undermine these fragile democracies. Um, and uh, Jack Snyder and his co-author have made uh, uh, compelling arguments that under certain conditions, and particularly civil war conditions, that demands for prosecutions are likely to lead to a worsening of human rights violations and are likely to undermine democracy and perhaps exacerbate conflict. And so it's been a lively debate. Jack and I have been going on on this about, I don't know, five, six, seven years now, right? We've been having this argument. So it's, it's fun to continue the argument uh, with Jack. Um, so in order to address this, we used the database and particularly we compared transitional countries that had a trial experience, this is the bottom dark line, with transitional countries that had no trial experience. And so basically trying to, instead of using case studies, which had been mainly used to this point, we tried to uh, use uh, comparisons, empirical statistical comparisons of countries that had trials with those who did not. I should say that the full statistical analysis, again done with a co-author, Han Jun Kim, who is the expert in statistics, I am not, um, it will be published by International Studies Quarterly in an article this December. And so anyone who would like the full regression tables, uh, those will be available to you in December within the journal ISQ. I'm going to present to you just some very basic, uh, just a very basic kind of snapshot summary of uh, the findings. So this um, top uh, table is comparing, okay, the repression score. So people who are not familiar, there's a large quantitative literature on human rights these days. It uses a repression score that's coded by researchers from Amnesty International and the reports and from State Department annual country human rights reports. Okay, So it's a number, uh, there's two different measures, one's from zero to five, one to five and one's from, I'm getting feedback again here. Uh, and one is from uh, 0 to 8. So what this is showing is the, um, what this is showing here, this middle gray line, is showing the global mean. That's a global repression mean of, tra of transitional countries. Okay? How much average repression do these transitional countries have in our database? The uh, dotted line here is the, um, the countries with no trial experience, okay, countries with no trial experience. And the dash, dark dashed line is the countries with trial experience. And so basically what this is showing is that the average repression score of countries with no trial experience, the higher number here in repression, is greater, uh, in kind of in a stable way greater after about 1994 than the states uh, with uh, trial experience down here. Um, in the second table, we're trying to compare uh, the global mean here. We're trying to compare countries with just one trial year to, country, to states with multiple trial years. It's a little bit harder to see, but again, we have the, the global mean line here. Uh, and then we have states with one trial year, which is this kind of zigzaggy dotted line, and the states with multiple trial years, this, dashed, this lower dashed line. And so again, and our, our Statistical analysis and regression tables support this, uh, that there are countries that are more persistent with their use of prosecutions seem to see a, a bigger improvement uh, in their human rights. 
uh, situation. So basically, the, the three main conclusions that come from the statistical analysis are first that um, are first that countries that have used human rights prosecutions, it appears to be associated with improvements in human rights. What we don't know yet exactly are the mechanisms through which these prosecutions translate into improved human rights. So we don't actually know whether it's deterrence, whether it's punishment, or whether it's what uh, uh, Laura and others have been referred to as the expressive nature of law. Okay, trials, of course, are not just punishment. Trials are high-profile, symbolic events that communicate uh, and dramatize norms. Uh, and so we don't know what's doing the work, probably both the, the, this increase in the likelihood of punishment or this, this expressing the norm, communicating, performing these, these norms. Um, second, we found that this holds even in situations of civil war. Now, mind you, civil war makes human rights worse. We're not saying it doesn't. Civil war is, is consistently the best predictor of bad human rights conditions. But when you add actual prosecutions to a civil war situation, it doesn't seem to make it even worse. Um, and then the third and maybe the most intriguing finding we have is something we call deterrence across borders. And that is that countries that are in a region where their neighbors have used lots of human rights prosecutions see some kind of improvement in their human rights, even if they themselves have not used prosecutions. Um, and so there would appear to be that, uh, you know, when you sit in, in Uruguay and you look across the river plate at trials in Argentina, even if you're not having trials of your own military, it appears to have an impact uh, in your country. Um, Okay, well, let me just turn to just some final conclusions. I want to have two. I want to have, talk a little about policy uh, implications here and theoretical implications. Uh, you know, one policy implication is just that, um, that the, I believe that these human rights prosecutions are a uh, now well-established in domestic law and practice, international and international law and practice. I don't think they're going to go away. Uh, I don't think they're ephemeral. Uh, and partly they're not so because they're well grounded in this legal, in this firm legal stream bed of hard law. Um, also, with many years of experience, some of the fear and the risk that the early prosecutions provoked has evaporated. Okay, so when, the, when there was a, a, a coup attempt against the Argentine government, when it was attempting trials, Everyone was very afraid. Everyone thought these trials are dangerous. But now, um, 25 years later, m many, many countries around the world, and, m and particularly many countries in Latin America, have used these prosecutions. And at least in Latin America, there has been no successful coup attempt ever as a result of prosecutions. And so it has diminished fears. Now, fears still exist. For example, in the United States today, you still hear many people saying it's way too dangerous, it's way too risky for us to be able to prosecute Bush administration officials for torture during the Bush administration. And my main, <laughs> my feeling about this, there's lots of good political reasons why a country might choose not to hold prosecutions. I certainly do not say every country must immediately hold human rights prosecutions. Okay? I believe that, that countries need to consider their political circumstances and make decisions about transitional justice. What I, don't, what, what I have less patience for is that officials want to use causal arguments about conflict uh, in order to justify the decisions. They want to say, no, we can't hold prosecutions because it will undermine our democracy, because it will provoke war, because, uh, it, will, um, because it will exacerbate human rights practices. So I want to say, no, there's actually not good evidence of that. So if you politically you feel you can't do it, then politically say, you know, trials are unpopular, we'll lose the midterm elections. But, do, but I, don't, I think countries should not be dressing up their political reasons with social science arguments. Um, theoretically, what I'd like to conclude is that um, part of what I'm saying here is stuff that's very familiar to people who have followed my work before. Okay, so once again, we have the, the, the 
individual criminal accountability norm goes through the norm life cycle that Martha Finnemore and I described many years ago in an article. Once again, the norm entrepreneurs are an important uh, necessary condition to help explain the emergence and the spread of, the, of this new norm. But I think there's some new material here too, and for a long time I've argued that in order to explain real world experiences, uh, we are often going to need to combine the ideational theory that comes from constructivism with more rationalist explanations. And I think that this case offers a really good example of how that works. So for example, the norm of individual criminal accountability depends on these norm entrepreneurs, but the countries that can be the early adopters of those norms are countries like Greece or Argentina or Portugal where the spoilers and power holders have been weakened. Okay? But, and here's maybe where Jack and I have a disagreement, but eventually, as the cascade proceeds, that condition is no longer necessary. Okay? So the domestic conditions of weakened power, uh, the, the, the weakened power holders is necessary for early adopters, but the diffusion phenomenon is such that at a certain point, your domestic conditions are less important, and what's more important to explain whether or not you use prosecutions is how many other countries in your region are using prosecutions. So we get an imitation phenomena that's more important than whether or not uh, uh, you had, you lo your power holders lost at war. And that's what's really interesting about these diffusion phenomena. Um, Secondly, another way in which I think kind of rationalist and, and, and constructivist arguments interact here is on one hand the norm entrepreneurs are pressing for the emergence of this, um, of this new law and yet at the same time one of the mechanisms through which, I, I believe one of the mechanisms but I can't prove it yet, through which the law translates into prevention is uh, punishment, is the likelihood of punishment, is real costs imposed on perpetrators and the fear that future uh, perpetrators have that they, their career could suffer, they could be put in jail, whatever. And so there is a combination here of ideational factors that are working with uh, more material or more rationalist factors to explain this, uh, this outcome. Um, so let me end there and just say I'm, I'm, thank you again for coming and I'm, I'm so pleased that I'll have the remarks from my two commentators. Well, thanks, Catherine. That was uh, a, a great example of uh, what I was uh, hoping we could accomplish here and have uh, a rigorous social science analysis that would really engage the issues that practitioners are concerned with every day. So we uh, have our two commentators to uh, respond. Oh, yeah. uh, and we're going to begin with uh, Richard Dicker who uh, directs the uh, Human Rights Watch program on international justice. And among other things, he's the guy that the New York Times calls up when they need a quote on, hey, what do you think of the legal process in the trial of Milosevic or Saddam Hussein? So uh, what do you think of mm -hmm. Catherine Well. <laughs> I won't uh, attempt to translate that into a soundbite uh, uh, at this moment. I'll, I'll wait for the reviewers to call uh, from the New York Times. But um, let me uh, make a couple of uh, points <clears throat> based on uh, the text. I mean, first and foremost, uh, from my perspective as a practitioner, um, uh, the justice cascade could not be uh, more timely and more important to an intense and what I regard to be rather high stakes fight that's taking place uh, in the realm of uh, international politics and, and, pra and practice. And specifically, what I mean is um, we're at a moment when 
the ad hoc tribunals, the Yugoslav tribunal, Rwanda tribunal, are in the process of closing down, um, pretty much leaving the International Criminal Court as likely the sole international institution uh, dispensing justice. And its mandate, the mandate of the court, uh, is under very, very sharp attack. And one need only refer to the situations where the court is carrying out investigations and has issued arrest warrants uh, to see the, the truth of that assertion. In Darfur, for example, um, uh, the arrest warrant against Sudanese President Omar al-Bashir has triggered an intense, and to use uh, uh, Catherine's term vituperative, uh, uh, debate and backlash against justice. Um, uh, in the Congo, uh, an outstanding arrest warrant against uh, uh, a Congolese warlord who is now a general in the Congolese armed forces uh, has prompted both the president and just last week the justice minister to say, uh, Peace trumps justice at this point, and we are not going to arrest Bosco and Tanganda. Um, I would predict in Kenya, where the court has just opened an investigation, when the arrest warrants for high-ranking officials connected with the post-election violence in Kenya, when those are issued, and even before, we will hear from Kenyan officials that these arrest warrants jeopardize prospects for the 2012 election. Um, so these are real questions that have, in a sense, uh, in some instances paralyzed, in other instances mobilized international organizations like the United Nations, the European Union, the African Union, and others. So. This research is invaluable from a practical sense, and I would just uh, stop on that note by uh, drawing your attention to the fact that the International Criminal Court has a mandate that is different than the Yugoslav, Rwanda, uh, Sierra Leone special courts in that its mandate allows it to conduct investigations into ongoing conflicts where justice is on the table at the same time as other important but very different diplomatic and political objectives such as negotiating a peace agreement or deploying peacekeeping forces uh, to protect populations at risk as in Darfur. So, so timely, so important. I think the methodology and the conclusions uh, that, that Catherine has drawn um, are very important for the reason that the debate, I believe, has grown stale. In other words, in the face of the justice cascade that the book describes, we have seen, and I don't mean to be unfair here, from the peace mediation community, a kind of reflexive reaction. Not only that justice makes their work of negotiating an end to conflict more difficult, but rather, as, as Catherine uh, referred to, um, justice is a dangerous element in upending the prospects for peace, um, as I said, and, and it is an extremely intense uh, debate, and I think there is an intense need for new facts to be put on the table that reflect a, a sophisticated and rigorous research methodology uh, to kind of stir this debate and advance it forward. Now, um, uh, I won't advertise Human Rights Watch's report entitled Selling Justice Short, but <laughs> I'm glad to talk to you about it on the side. I don't want to take attention away from the main act. But um, uh, some research we did based on 20 years of fact-finding to make some of the points in a less compelling uh, and, and well-researched way uh, than Catherine does. Um, 
Uh, but there is a crying need for new analysis and new facts on this debate, to t in this debate, to take on the arguments. Now, um, I, I want to conclude by teasing out uh, from, from uh, the book a couple of points that are implicit um, and make them uh, more explicit. One, the uneven distribution of justice. And your last chapter, of course, deals with the United States and the reaction and practice of the Bush administration. Let me say that it's an ugly fact and reality that we practitioners have to recognize, particularly those of us based here in New York or in Paris or in London, um, that the playing field is very uneven when it comes to the application of justice. And there's no better example of that unevenness than, one, the opposition of the previous administration to the International Criminal Court and the practices that uh, the administration engaged in in regard to torture and the lack of likely judicial remedies for victims of those practices. That indicates, one, a huge gap in the reach of justice, and two, to those, and particularly I can say from my own experience in Addis Ababa uh, at the African Union, gives opponents of justice quite a card to play by pointing to the lack of reach of justice to the Bushes, the Rumsfelds, as well as to the Putins and others responsible for crimes in, in Chechnya. I, d I don't want to um, strike an anti-American note here as if it's only Washington uh, that has insulated itself from the reach of justice. Uh, the same can very well be said uh, uh, of Moscow. And, and this uneven application where the leaders of the most powerful states and those they protect are immune from justice is an ugly reality that also undercuts the legitimacy of the norm in those parts of the world that have experienced horrific human rights violations for which there has been zero accountability. I'm thinking of Africa under colonial rule uh, as one example, all right? Uh, and many, many, many other places. Uh, second to last point, um, I think the, the cascade, you know, which has a powerful uh, image, you know, I fear as a practitioner who's very much on the defensive, uh, in, a, in a sense, wearing my flak jacket to work every day trying to uh, fight off this and that assault uh, on justice mechanisms, um, I feel there's a fragility in the norm that is rooted in the fact that states will readily jettison justice in order to advance diplomatic and political objectives. Um, and that justice, while it is a norm, is a weak norm compared to the traditional values and objectives of statecraft. Concretely, what that means is when the Security Council is more interested in a peace settlement, um, uh, it will become much less interested in seeing the arrest warrants for the tribunals it itself created actually executed, uh, whether that's in Bosnia or whether that's in Darfur. So uh, justice, it's fragile, um, gets jettisoned, and that also serves to undercut, I fear, its legitimacy. Last question um, that you haven't uh, uh, really ad addressed in the book, and, 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 and maybe there's no, no scope to do so, but really, what are some of the scenarios that could unfold? I agree with you that we're not going to have a reversal uh, to the pre-1945 point, mm -hmm. by no means. I mean, that train has left the station and it's not going back. Um, uh, the, the treaties, uh, despite what Norton might argue with you, <laughs> are very important in creating that international law stream bed that you refer to. What I fear 
is not the total reversal, but in a sense the marginalization. Um, uh, that the norm becomes more respected in its dishonor um, than in its application. And as you say in the book, justice is such a particular, um, particularly emotive and uh, in some ways emotional norm. It generates such expectations. I fear that we are looking at a possibility, I, I wouldn't say probability, that the justice cascade could be tamed um, and, and marginalized and made to be lot, much less of an actor or force, rather, on the international terrain and thus lose some of its legitimacy and some of its force. Uh, that, I think, is the worst case scenario, uh, uh, not reversal, um, but to me, day to day, uh, it's a real possibility. Thank you. I want that still. I'm going to refer to one of those one of those slides. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. oh, sorry. Uh, the, if, you, if, you, if you can put that, that last figure at some point. Um, okay. That. Um, the Justice Cascade is an immensely engaging account of a scholar's own personal journey and of, and of how to combine moral passion with systematic social science. And it's a fascinating uh, analysis of how the movement to hold state leaders personally responsible for crimes began and spread. <clears throat> it has an optimistic and progressive tone that is a wonderful antidote to the pervasive cynicism of much of the professional literature in political science as well as the media. Students and other readers under the age of, of 45 will not only gain an understanding of the origins and diffusion of a human rights movement that they might otherwise t take for granted, they will gain insights into the process of international relations scholarship no. at its best. I'm, I'm definitely going to, uh, to assign this book in my International Law and Politics Seminar. The only real question is whether I can de bear to delay it to my section on human rights law and accountability or whether it, it should be the, of the first week's reading to signal why the subject is so exciting. So I, th I think it's a, f it's a wonderful book. And my only, uh, I was a little bit disturbed that you took seriously what your editor said about what, what you should write. Uh, <laughs> never let editors tell you what to write or to emphasize. In the old saying about policy experts, uh, editors should be on tap, not on top. You tell them what to do. They don't tell you what to do. Uh, you're a scholar, and, and they aren't. So uh, you're above them. And so uh, don't, don't, don't let them tell you what to do. Um, the Justice Cascade also has many analytical virtues. It traces the origins of the emerging norm that former state leaders should be subject to prosecution for acts committed on their authority when in office, of which, as Catherine shows, and it's, and it's said here, is a very novel claim. Uh, and it achieves all these results that, that you've seen in an eclectic way. Uh, in particular, uh, uh, Catherine refutes three pernicious dichotomies. And the, the bane of international relations theory right now is dichotomies, stupid, false dichotomies. And Catherine doesn't engage in this and, in fact, uh, refutes three of them. She refutes the dichotomy be between deterrence and norms, the dichotomy between punishment and truth commissions, and the grand dichotomy of all, the dumbest of all, realism versus blank. In this case, realism versus constructivism. No one in their right mind, I think, who studies international politics uh, believes that realism is all false. There's a lot of truth in that. Uh, but nobody, I think, in their right mind believes it's the whole truth either. And the notion that these are alternative views, you have to choose between them, is about the silliest thing I've ever heard. And it still is, it pervades the international relations literature. It's the most depressing thing about my field. Uh, Catherine shows how various streams of events came together to change the impunity norm and how a variety of different mechanisms seem to enhance the effectiveness of trials. And furthermore, she's modest in, in her text. She indicates that her conclusion about the trial's effectiveness is challenged by others and should be viewed as tentative pending further analysis. So all these accomplishments would make the Justice Cascade uh, very important, if, even if it were not so engaging. I have only one serious question about the inference that, that you make about effectiveness. Uh, and that's why I want this, this up. And uh, then I have several other more general points to make about uh, implications of the analysis. The big analytical problem with the argument that trials are effective, which is indicated, suggested by this chart, is what we call in political science endogeneity. That is, the trials could be a symptom 
of deeper underlying causes. It could be that this could be, this all could be right, but the trials could not be causally important at all. They could reflect something. And Catherine in her text is explicit about this. But there are some uh, intriguing problems. In the, in the figure, this figure that I saw in your manuscript went back to 1980. And this one starts in 1987. That's important because in, when I comment on the manuscript, I pointed out that the, um, the dash line there, uh, which the, the dash line which, uh, begins, mm -hmm. if you go back to 1980, it begins at a very low point, almost here, and it steeply rises mm -hmm. to meet the other lines. Mm -hmm. In other words, the states that later have trials are those in which repression increased dramatically in the first half of the 1980s. So these states, the states that, that later have trials are different, and you, you, you mentioned this before in your talk too, are different from the states that, that didn't um, later have trials. And I, I imagine this finding is probably driven by Latin America, Argentina, Uruguay, El Salvador, Guatemala. But what it does suggest is what we call lack of unit homogeneity in the, in the, in the repressive states. That is, they aren't all alike. And there may be something specifically different about the states that both had what might be called late repression, that is repression went way up from a low point from 1980 to 87, which is what that, if that dash line uh, were shown from 1980, that's what it would show. It would go from 1980, very low levels of, of, of repression up to meet the point you see it at in 1987. Um, and, and so these states may be different. That is, um, they, that's what we call omitted variables. There's something else about these states that could be driving the results, uh, which is correlated with but not causally associated with the outcome. And an obvious candidate is a previous recent history of democracy. And I want to ask you about that. That is, there, the states that had trials and that therefore, and, and that later do better, are also states that were more democratic earlier. So as an obvious candidate, which is independent of trials. Trials could be inconsequential. The obvious candidate is a previous history of democracy, the still the existence of, of civil society, uh, groups that are going to press for, de for democracy, and they, in this, in this story, uh, are temporarily eclipsed by these repressive military regimes, but they come back. And so as, as they come back, they bounce back, uh, repression falls. Nothing could be nothing to do with trials. So the causal mechanisms, in my view, are not clear. It's pretty clear that trials don't have a disastrous effect because then you'd have a different pattern. But it's not clear that the trials are doing the causal work for you. And so I think that I would make that clear to say what you've shown is that trials are not having a negative disastrous effect. I think you have not shown that trials are making a positive difference. Now I have four more general themes that I wanted to, um, to just uh, signal because the book is so good at, at uh, touching on them. The first is the interaction of politics and law. Some of you presumably are political scientists, some are legal scholars. Law and politics are always in tension because law is general, it's, it's universal, and it's normative. It's supposed to apply generally to a class of situations or people without regard to their ascriptive characteristics or their power. Politics is not, is most of politics is non-normative, it's opportunistic, and it certainly is power laden. So these are in a continual tension with each other. And Richard's comments just suggested that tension. There's never going to be perfect justice because, as, as uh, Lucidity said, uh, the strong do what they can and the weak suffer what they must. Now, Catherine has shown that the strong don't always do that. There's some incursions on that old wisdom, but the strong can do more. Um, and so if we think about the intersection of politics and law, um, there were political conditions that Catherine mentioned for normative change. The end of the Cold War was a big one. Mm -hmm. That was a power, big, huge power shift that made it possible to take all these actions. Law then provided an opening for norm entrepreneurs. That's really important. Law is normative. It gives a handle to people like you. You can grab on and say, look, we've got these, these laws. Why don't you apply them everywhere? Why, why aren't you applying these powerful people? And that's a very powerful, very strong, very strong handle. And domestic politics then comes in and propels pressure for change. If you weren't working in a democracy, didn't have a large democracy behind you, you wouldn't make nearly as much money as you make. Because the domestic politics also says, well, we have domestic principles here of, of, of democracy. Why aren't they being applied internationally? So there's a powerful, powerful leverage there. Um, 
and then, and then uh, law can turn, sometimes can create institutions like the ICC, which uh, take these little openings that you get and then widen them because you have an institutional base for them. And you can bring cases and you've got principals and judges uh, 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 to operate. But you always have to realize that power disparities are always going to push back. They're always going to matter. So it's always going to be the case, in my view, that there will be justice disparities. So that someone can say 50 years from now, even if we've made a lot, a lot of progress, it'll still be true that there's not perfect balance of justice between the, the poor and the, and the disadvantaged. And those not, the, um, I, I read recently a comment on a very good paper by Maximo Langer, who's at uh, Argentina, who's at, probably know, who's at NYU this year. He looks at universal jurisdiction. And he finds that, the, that there are lots of cases, uh, lots of complaints, over 1,000 complaints he's cataloged systematically, 32 trials, and 28 of them are of n former Nazis, uh, Rwandans, Afghans from the 80s, and Serbs. In other words, these people don't have states to support them. The states are defunct or discredited. Uh, so the filtering process is still a, f a process in which states really play a major role. Uh, in, in it. So in a, politics and law is what fascinates me about the whole subject. The second um, issue, range of issues which you touch on, and maybe we can talk about it more, I won't talk about it long, is that, um, what, and what I love about this project, is about change in world politics. Mm -hmm. And one of the pathologies of international relations theory, until you came along and some other people, uh, you particularly, Catherine, it was that the, that the uh, conventional wisdom was, as Kenneth Waltz put it, that patterns repeat themselves endlessly. And it's the, it's the merry go round goes around again and again. The, uh, the animals are painted a little bit different colors, but it's the same thing. And of course, there's something to that. Times today, U.S. and Vietnam are in rapprochement with each other. Why is that? Balance of power theory explains it perfectly. China is getting bigger and, and, and more assertive. So there's some real truth here. Uh, but, and, but much of our theory has overemphasized that in all branches. Realism, I just cited. Institutional theory often talks about how institutions persist and how they affect behavior and how they're hard to change and the legacies of institutions are difficult to get rid of. Uh, the constructivist notion mostly is not about change, it's about appropriateness, what behavior is appropriate, uh, and that's also a static story. So the, oh, this, this, this work that Catherine is doing is a wedge for more systematic discussion, I think, of change in world politics in this area and others, and that's uh, another way in which you're exercising leadership. A third point I wanted to make, my next to last one, um, was suggested by what you were saying today about, you, essentially I interpret you as saying that this, it wasn't even imagined uh, 20, 25 years ago, 30 years ago, that this sort of process of individual accountability of people in high positions in states uh, could be instituted. And so even activists would say, oh no, no, don't say that, it's just too scary, it's just too ridiculous, people think we're utopians. And this raises a question which we haven't really talked about in world politics enough, or what are the boundaries of imagination and how do ideas about what is possible change? And this happened long ago with the League of Nations. It was certainly thought 100, 100 years ago, probably, uh, certainly 110 years ago, the notion of having a League of Nations was, was absurd. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't have a serious conversation about it until probably around 1910. Um, and the notion of formal adjudication in the WTO with binding adjudication in a legal process, I thought that was nutso, and I'm an institutionalist, I'm not a realist, uh, uh, 25 years ago. I wouldn't have thought that was going to happen. It happened uh, several years later. Uh, so we should be talking a little bit also about perceptions and, and, and reality. So often we're, our, our perceptions that something is impossible are true. And very often people are nutso, <laughs> and it's not going to happen. But we ought to think a little more about when, when the change in perceptions of what is possible actually can create a, a, an, opening, an opening for possibility. And my last point, just uh, in a, very briefly, is about uh, something that interests me particularly now, about persuasion. There's been some work on persuasion in students in, city, in world policy. I don't think it's terribly persuasive uh, because it's focused mostly on what I, what I call direct persuasion. Uh, I, one leader tries to persuade another leader of something. Problem is that leaders are well and very well informed. They have very clear notions of what their interests are, and they're therefore not very subject to persuasion. It's also true. John Mearsheimer has a new book coming out, which he shows he went and looked at lying in international politics, and he thought he'd find lots of lying 
being good, hard, hard nosed realist. He found very little lying. For the same reason. Why should I lie to you if you know I'm, if you know I'm lying to you, if you know I know I'm lying to you? Mm -hmm. What good does it do me in talking to you as a head of state to, to lie to you? Mm -hmm. uh, it's not, not going to do much good. Uh, or, or to try to persuade you, basically. Mm -hmm. However, I think there's not enough discussion of what I call indirect persuasion. Uh, that is, most people, audiences, are non-strategic actors. There, there's no reason to act strategically if you're one of 300 million people who are responding to Martin Luther King's uh, talk or to Kofi Annan's talk. Um, and uh, yet, if you change your mind, uh, because in, furthermore, you're not very well informed, so a small amount of information might change your mind, you could then, in, in a democratic society, uh, put pressure on leaders who then, even if they don't change their minds, behave as if they did because they're responding to political pressure. So I think, I, my, my guess is that Behind the story you're telling are a lot of stories about indirect persuasion in which norm entrepreneurs and the political leaders whom they, influ whom they recruit or influence uh, uh, persuade large audiences of non-strategic actors in democratic publics to change their view on what's possible and what should be done, and these people then put pressure on political leaders, and that that's the process much more than a direct persuasion process. But something is underlying the story you're telling, and I'm trying to make some suggestions about getting at that. I do have comments, but since uh, Susan's standing there, maybe we should just have you go ahead. <laughs> Are you sure? I'm yes. happy to stand. No, please go it's ahead. Good for you to stand. I think it's time for. It's always great to to okay. have people get involved. From the um, I have one just sort of factual question, and then something that follows on something that Bob has already said. Um, I had been persuaded by Bronwyn Liebau's analysis of Nuremberg, where she takes Dieter Schlar's analysis of legalism, that is to say individual criminal accountability as being established then, and then names it human rights legalism as it comes. So I'm just curious about where you disagree with her, because you start the, you know, yours is in the third wave. And then I was also very, I, I'm so pleased that Bob focused on causal mechanisms, because without reading the manuscript, I didn't know whether they were there, but they weren't there in the talk. And so I think particularly for policy recommendations, and there are a lot of us in the world, in this room even, who are wanting to have influence on, on this practical operational world that Richard's talking about. Um, I think we need to know what the causal mechanisms so we can give effective recommendations. And, and for that, I wanted to hear more disaggregation of some of your categories and then help me think through what I presume are different causal mechanisms in each case in terms of effectiveness or even causal ones. That is to say, why do we get the cascade in the way you say? The first is that, I, as I understand it, and please correct me, um, I saw your category of domestic prosecutions as being two separate types. Mm -hmm. One in countries where the, the, the abuses, violations actually happened in Argentina, mm -hmm. and another where other domestic jurisdictions like Britain on Pinochet took up the case. I would assume that those are quite different in terms of, certainly in terms of effectiveness, but influence and maybe even cost. The second is in, in your data and your, your dis description, the regional factor keeps coming up over and over again as if it's important. Mm -hmm. So what are you seeing? What, why would the regional it's in your diffusion, it's in your chronologies, it's, it's quite a number of things. So it, does it really matter or is that just happens to be interesting in terms of the cases? And the third and for me the most important is I, because I work on civil wars and post-conflict, um, transitional justice is two very different categories. For me there's Rudy Title's understanding of it and then there's the post-Cold War stuff. Those are very different understandings of transitional justice including the role that these courts should play. Mm -hmm. 
and prosecution should play. And then I also don't think of human rights as necessarily a part of those two. So I first wanted to say, well, there's human rights and then there's transitional justice, but because I think of transitional justice as at least two separate categories in terms of thinking about um, mechanisms, I'd like to hear you just help me think through how your data apply to that differentiation because um, this idea, I think it is a false debate whether it's individual states or member states on the Security Council, whether P5 or not, between peace and justice, it really does depend upon what it is that we're talking about and what our objective is. It might very well be that the mechanisms for transitional justice in post-conflict are better achieved by non-tribunal, non-individual criminal, for example, that is different from transitions among regimes, which is quite different from enforcement of international human rights law. Yeah, I think we should gather a few questions, maybe, or comments. Thanks. I have a two-part question, actually. The first one, if I understand these graphs actually correctly, then this is a subset of countries, and there may be some countries going in and out. I wasn't entirely clear on that. But I was wondering whether you could tell us what those graphs would look like when we looked at all countries or maybe all non-democracies. And here's why I'm, I'm asking. So beyond the immediate effect in states that actually have trial experience, I would think if I'm an authoritarian ruler or, or, or part of, of the, the ruling repressing elite, and I see these trials increasingly going on and I observe some kind of form of a norm against these forms of repression and I'm seeing that I may actually be called to justice at some point later even if I travel, either if I travel abroad without proper care or, or maybe because there's going to be a regime change within my own country, I'm going to be more careful. And so I would expect that if these norms actually have a deterrence effect, then even these average values should show some kind of declining over time, at least after the norm becomes effective. And I was curious whether uh, whether you have any indication that that's taken place. The, the second and, and somewhat sort of broader question that, that made me wonder about is, <coughs> do we have any good theoretical reasons to expect a particular time lag? There's how much time should pass after the beginning of these new practices or maybe the, the intensive diffusion of these practices before we actually should see behavioral changes <laughs> as a consequence. And I'm, I'm not sure we, we do, and, and then ultimately, of course, a, a lot of the sort of empirical assessment of that would require actually really to work through that theoretical logic first. Thank you. A couple of questions. In your previous work, you have uh, uh, dealt with the issue of gender. And, 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 and I wonder to what extent your uh, current concerns um, deal with that issue, in particular that many of the gender issues uh, uh, or violations of, of, of gender issues are non-governmental. And, and to what extent your new framework accounts for, uh, for explaining uh, the grievances and the violations of of gender rights, and uh, so that's one question. And my 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 second question uh, deals with uh, the current uh, colonial uh, uh, encounters in 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 the current uh, international settings namely the relationships between Israel and Palestine and the Israeli expansion and, and ever expanding into the Palestinian rights and Palestinian uh, existence and whether or not your model explains violations against Palestinian rights. Thank you. Well, 
maybe I should, there's so, so many interesting questions and comments that people have given, so what, maybe I should try to just um, briefly try to address a few of the, the points that people have made. Um, and so I'm very sympathetic to, to Richard's points about the, the idea that, that justice that this is a fragile process and is a power-laden process. And in this, on this particular issue, I think that, that Bob has said it as I would, that as a political scientist, never expects power to go away. Uh, and that the kind of analysis I do, and maybe I can just briefly, I can briefly do this. Oops, no, okay. There, the, the kind of analysis I do, most um, human rights activists, most victims, uh, do something I call comparison to the ideal. They say, What's, what, you know, what kind of justice do we have compared to my ideal of justice? And it, by definition, we always fall short. Okay, so it's always a pessimistic exception. It's just how far short do we do? A lot of this is about counterfactual reasoning, and that is the whole, you know, the whole argument of the ICC in Sudan or in Uganda is all counterfactual reasoning. You know, so someone says, the indictment of, of Bashir has been made worse, has made worse the situation in Sudan than it would have been, the counterfactual, kind of than it would have been without the indictment. Other people make the exact opposite. They say, no, the situation in Sudan is better today than it would have been without the ICC involvement. We can't resolve that. And so I do this empirical comparison, and I go from where we were, where we started, to where we are today. And when you do that, things, you see what I believe is progress. And that's a, not always a popular word in international relations theorists, but I believe this co constitutes progress. Uh, but I would totally agree with Bob, we're never, we're never getting there. We're never getting to our ideals. And I think it's appropriate to, when people talk, make those things say, well, we're concerned here about change in world politics and how we move from a situation with with complete impunity to a situation where there's much less, there's certainly less impunity than there was, but we will never get to a situation where there's complete uh, justice and certainly not where there's even-handed justice. Okay. Um, uh, I'm gonna, the question of the many interesting points you've made, Bob, the one that I want to turn to is a question about persuasion. And that's because, um, so the issue is, what makes some arguments persuasive and some not persuasive? And political scientists haven't been able to address this, and it's because I think we won't address the intrinsic power of ideas, that particular ideas might have intrinsic power and be more persuasive than other ideas. And we don't want to do that because it's so hard, because once you say that, you have to say, what, what intrinsic quality uh, has that? And in Activists Beyond Borders, you know, I made an argument that bodily harm to vulnerable populations was an intrinsic, a intrinsically powerful idea that was going to be able to be more persuasive than other ideas. And this is another area where we ha we're talking about bodily harm, but we're talking about holding people accountable for bodily harm to vulnerable populations. So I think there's two things that make this issue persuasive. The first is the domestic analogy that I mentioned. It's persuasive because as soon as people can imagine it, that is possible, they have a model. They have a model in their own domestic judicial system that they take for granted. They say, but of course, someone who murders someone should be held criminally accountable and should be sent to jail. And so there's a commonplaceness that if you can just get, you can get rid of the idea that you can't hold state ac officials accountable. There's a commonplaceness, this idea that I think has made it persuasive and explains why we've seen more movement on this idea than many other ideas in national politics. Um, and then secondly, there's this, you know, this interesting debate over the moral instinct, but people say that part, that there are the, you know, that, that this desire for, uh, desire to see that norm breakers get punished is actually very, very widely shared, deeply across cultures. Um, so, um, okay, on these, the, the, thank you for the very interesting questions. Uh, and again, I can't answer all of them. So um, let me try to answer a, a, at least one from each person. Um,
you know, the, I want to let me talk about the regional factor because that interests me most. What, you know, I'm not the only political scientist. In fact, Beth Simmons, who will be here in the next talk, and many other political scientists are really picking up on regional effects nowadays. And mainly diffusion diffusion theories are showing a lot of regional effects. And the truth is, I think we don't know why. So I think we're seeing regional effects, but we don't understand why we're seeing regional effects. And we don't know what region is a proxy for. We suspect region is a proxy for something else, but we don't know what. Um, and, uh, you know, so Bob's there's a wonderful thing, thing that maybe the Latin America, you know, I've seen this regional effect on Latin America because virtually all the Latin American countries participated in the second wave of democracy. And so now what we're catching is this regional effect is partly that there are third wave countries that also had second wave experiences. That could be it. Um, I, in my research, see this role for these regional human rights institutions. Those institutions may also have been created as a result of a prior democratic experience, a prior commitment to human rights. Right? But it's very interesting the role the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights has played in Latin America, for example. Very almost surprising to me what an important role they played. So building these human rights institutions, which are some seen as, as empty exercises, at least in my case, turned out to be very important to do things they weren't set up to do, which is criminal accountability. The Inter-American Court is a state accountability court, and yet the Inter-American Commission in every country in Latin America that, that used prosecutions, there was a prior report by the American Commission calling on them to hold domestic trials and hold these people criminally accountable to the extent of the possible extent of the law. Um, so, uh, so the question about you know why am I only using a subset of countries? I'm only looking at transitional countries. Oh. Um, I do have a second database of all countries in the world, um, and I'm not using that for our statistical analysis, and I'm not using it because it, I, don't, uh, I don't trust all the trials, especially in authoritarian countries. You know, so I, in other words, it's listed as a trial, but we're, we can't really tell in these authoritarian contexts whether it's kind of a kangaroo trial or whether it's a, a vengeance trial or whatever. But if I gave you the data that of all the countries in the world, the trend is even more dramatic, okay, even more dramatic uh, than the trend I showed you here. So I do have some data on that that suggests this is a global trend, that it's not limited to transitional societies, and it's happening both in fully democratic societies and in authoritarian societies as well. Um, so uh, now, then you sort of said, would I expect the human rights average values to decline in the world? Okay, even though I used that, that I'm using those human rights scores, I have another article where I critique the scores, not because I think they're unreliable, but kind of give a systematic bias. The human rights reporting has a systematic bias towards making things seem worse. Why? Because we've hugely more, not only that, but my co-author, Ann Clark, is right here in the audience I'm writing this article with. Ann Clark and I are arguing that there's a systematic information effect because what's happened over the last 30 years is that we have so much more information about human rights violations than we used to have. And so it's possible that some of these repression numbers, it's not that human rights is getting worse in the world, it's that we ha know a lot more about human rights than we did before. Now, what that means is that it's even harder to get the statistical result that I got with this data. It's even harder to show that anything leads to improvements. And so when you show that thing, things lead to improvements, you're fighting against that information effect in the data. Okay? Uh, but what that would suggest why it is we don't see a trend, why that global human rights repression line isn't trending downward and probably won't trend downward as long as so. Um, and then finally, the issue about, a uh, question about gender. Gender enters um, into this analysis uh, mainly in the way that it's entered into the um, prosecutions. And as people know from the international uh, and ad hoc tribunals, they have been very important for incorporating issues like an understanding of rape as a war crime. And that the Rome Statute, in fact, has been, I think, made particularly important advances with really incorporating gender issues and gender crimes for the first time into our understanding of crimes against humanity and war crimes. Um, and not only that, but there has been some in increase because of, I think, errors made early on in prosecutions 
uh, there's been increased sensitivity in dealing with victims uh, and providing testimony in tribunals to be particularly sensitive to trauma that victims experience. And I, I don't think that they're, you know, that they're doing a great job still, but I think there has been really increased sensitivity about how to handle highly traumatized victims, including uh, victims of gender crimes, uh, so that they can provide uh, testimony uh, in these tribunals. So there, there is a, a, a gender uh, dimension here. Um, we're not seeing prosecution for gender crimes as much in domestic tribunals as we are in international tribunals. And that's an interesting mm -hmm. fact uh, that I haven't analyzed yet. Um, Michael, yeah. Uh, do I need to use the mic for being recorded? Please do. Yeah. Please do. Uh, I agree with all of the commentators so far. It sounds like a wonderful book. I look forward to reading it. Mm -hmm. If you're dealing with my same editor at Norton, I understand why it's difficult to push back in just quite the way that Bob <laughs> is recommending that you do so. Um, two, two questions. One's a policy question and the other is an analytic question. On the analytic question, you had the graph up there where trials took place, didn't take place, whether they were short term or long term, and you show some very interesting trends out there. In, in some of the debates, people argue that uh, trials have another effect, slightly different from deterrence or, or, or persuasion or norm expression, is that they have good short run effects if they take place because they take the thugs off the streets, they lock them up. And so you'll have a reduction in repression that takes place as a short run effect. But then eventually the deeper underlying tensions of society reemerge and they go back to repression and conflict, et cetera. The other theory is quite different. They say that if you have trials, then people push back. And it either leads to an outbreak of war again, which is increases in repression and violence, or street level violence uh, takes place that uh, makes for a scheme of repression. And it's only in the long run when a set of trials, if they do take place, set the record straight and they uh, preclude uh, nationalist myth making. You know, how many people did the Croatian Nazi Serbs actually kill in 1943 or 44 turns out to be important in uh, 1990. So on the one hand, they expect a big short run effect and a little long run effect. And then on the other hand, uh, a, a, a negative short run effect, but a positive long run effect. So my, my question is, does your data allow you to lag the, 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 the period between the trial and then the measure of repression. Can you add 10 years, for example, to it? Do you go far enough back to, to allow that to happen? And if you do, what did you find? Or if, if you didn't, what do you think you might find if you did that kind of exercise? The, the second question is a policy question. And this is back to Bashir in Sudan. Uh, Harold Coe was visiting Columbia Law School yesterday and gave a, his pitch for why, why Obama is better than Bush on, on the rule of law. He persuaded everybody in the room on his basic thesis, needless to say. Uh, I, I pressed him a little bit on, on Sudan and I asked him the following question, that there's been talk of normalization uh, with uh, Sudan if the uh, referendum in the South Sudan proceeds in an orderly fashion and there is no uh, military reaction to the outcome, that is if the North allows the South to secede under some terms and doesn't invade to take the oil back. And the, the question I asked him is what does normalization mean and does it mean lifting of the indictment of Bashir? And Harold is the good lawyer he is, rattled off without a blink th three legal reasons why it could be lifted. Just, just like that. Um, I, I don't think you're interested in them. But uh, the, question, the thing that struck me is that this is not the first time he's thought about that question. Uh, <laughs> President Obama met with heads of state on September 17th or 18th uh, on the issue of S Sudan right here in New York. And so the question is, presumably the lifting of the indictment is on the table. Harold thinks it could be done legally. Um, and the question is, is this a good idea or not, given what you've uh, studied about uh, the role of uh, trials and, uh, and peace? Right. Um, um, I'm also looking forward very much to reading your book. Um, and um, the, the thought that occurred to me, and I think uh, Professor Cohane just touched on it uh, uh, um, in his uh, very interesting comments, 
um, is one that uh, is of interest to practitioners in terms of what sort of advice one gives in these sort of situations. I think your distinction between uh, ruptured and pacted transitions is a, a key distinction uh, that may lead to other explanatory aspects. Uh, and, and I guess, and I haven't done any research on this one, I guess the trials, of course, tend to happen more in the ruptured situations and the truth and reconciliation commissions tend to happen more in the pacted situations. So what I think would be interesting in your, uh, in your squiggly lines is to um, ask yourself, let's look at those pacted um, uh, situations where you did have a, a truth and, and reconciliation commission and ask, your, ask the same question. What sort of impact did it have? Because um, if it... Uh, is distinguishable amongst the non-trial holding countries, then you're looking at another policy option in terms of the advice one gives to the, the countries going through transition. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm going to start with that one just because we actually have done, we actually have looked at that question. And there's another research project that my colleague Lee Payne is doing, and she's also looked at it, and we have contrary, contradictory results on that question. So Hun Jun Kim and I looked, and we found that truth commissions were also associated with some improvements in human rights. Um, very often countries do both trials and truth commissions, by the way. And so even though there's this notion that you do one piece, uh, that you do uh, justice or truth, it turns out that most, all the countries in Latin America that held prosecutions also had truth commissions, for example. So more often, truth commissions and trials are used together. Uh, and then there's countries that do little or do nothing. Um, but nevertheless, we, we, were able, we looked at the impact of truth commissions and, and we found a positive impact. Lee Payne, however, found a negative impact of truth commissions. And we think it's because we code slightly differently. We only code truth commissions that have reports, published reports. And she, they've been coding truth commissions whether or not they have published reports. And it could be that a truth commission with a published report is actually a more sincere uh, a truth commission that you would expect it to have an impact, and indeed that's what we're seeing. Um, but uh, so that, but that's exactly one, that's what we're trying to get at, this difference between punishment and uh, and normative communication, because the truth commissions only are only normative communication. There's no punishment involved. And so if the mechanism, this goes to Susan's point, if the mechanism is norm communication, then we would expect both truth commissions and, and trials to work. If it's punishment, then we expect only trials to work, and in fact only trials with convictions to work. And we're not seeing that. We're seeing that the whole process of prosecution, even short of convictions, for, for example, the Milosevic uh, trial, no conviction. So when people are only coding, if they're only coding verdicts convictions, they'd code nothing. Most of it doesn't count. It's a big zero. And we think that'd be a big mistake. Pinochet, no conviction, no verdict. We think that'd be a big mistake because there's this communicative process as well. Um, so basically, the, the, we, we don't have a good answer for you yet on that one, but it's a really important question. Um, what we are seeing is that the combination of trials and truth commissions are, uh, tends to be particularly effective and tends to be very common. And it, it's, we do think it's that old dichotomy that's not useful, truth versus justice. It, it's usually not the case. You have to choose one or the other, or the countries do. Um, okay, um, my, Michael's point, this really interesting point about um, about short versus long run effects. We do look, we do lag, and we do look effects over a, a 10 year period. We do see that um, countries that make more persistent use of trials, so one trial versus more persistent use of trials, do see a bigger effect up to a certain point, and then there seems to be diminishing returns. Um, and so uh, we don't see that they have good short run and then it disappears. Um, and so. Um, but this relates to, I think, the earlier question about how long would we expect it to take. And I've been thinking, because of you know, my knowledge of, kind of Latin American cases, more of generational effects. <coughs> that, in fact, the perpetrators themselves, the in, deterrence theory actually sometimes refers to it as a, not as deterrence, but incapacitation, <coughs> what you said. You want to give the people behind bias and incapacitate them because, in fact, they are not objects of deterrence. Someone who's already committed a crime is not an object of deterrence. They can only be inca incapacitated behind but, the people we're interested in is the next generation, military leaders or security force or police leaders in Latin America who are coming up through the ranks and who are looking at that and saying, 
maybe it's not a good career choice to do that. And if it's a, if it's a generational effect, we would expect a lag as that new generation comes in. Um, and then the harder question that I didn't know this about, about Harold. Um, okay. This is what I think. One, I've already explained that I think the um, interpretations of what's going on in Sudan or Uganda are entirely based on counterfactual arguments. Okay? It's an entirely counterfactual argument that if you lift the indictment against Bashir, that things are going to get better in Sudan. Okay? Some people say it. Some people say the opposite. We partly only have Bashir's word for it. Okay, in other words, the dilemma with taking Bashir's word for it is that person, I mean, I think in the strictly technical sense, he's a blackmailer. Okay, that basically Bashir is saying, you indict me, I will, you know, harm UN troops. I will uh, unleash war. Okay, so basically we have this guy who's blackmailing the international system to try to get rid of something he really doesn't like, which is an indictment. And my other people will be better experts in this, but my hunch is that giving in, but one, believing Bashir's counterfactual as the one that we accept, we U.S. policymakers, we smart people like Harold Coe, are going to buy Harold, are going to buy uh, Bashir's counterfactual, that only if we lift the indictment will things get better. Will there be peace in Sudan? Question. Secondly, it, you know, have we? Do we believe that giving in to blackmail is the best way? Yeah. <laughs> it, so how, you see that it's different because it's, uh, because, but it's implicit blackmail. So the implicit blackmail is that that. It's a deal. Okay. Yeah. yeah. My my feeling is that Bashir is not a. Um, I would not trust what he says. Okay. I would not trust what he says. Of course. He wants to get rid of the indictment. Of course, he will do everything possible in his power to get rid of the indictment. That's what we would expect. That's what a political scientist would expect. Now, will he keep his word? Well, I'm not sure why we'd expect him to keep his word, and I'm not sure why lifting the indictment would make him keep his word. Beca um, so I would be very hesitant. I think it'd be a mistake. I think the issue is that, as I think Bob has pointed out, you know, law will always be influenced by politics, but law disciplines politics. And it sounds to me like it would take legal gymnastics, even for Harold Coe, to do that. Uh, and um, that we would lose that disciplining power of law. I think, you know, the, I think powerful states should do what they need to do to deal with Bashir. The United States, England, they can all bilaterally or multilaterally negotiate with Bashir and they can give him what he wants and give him the deal they want. What they shouldn't do is try to turn the ICC into a, a, a tool, into their tool. Because if powerful states turn the ICC into their tool, they've lost what's most effective about the ICC and that's effectively, it's not, uh, it's, it's an exercise of law that not anything goes. So tonight we've gotten great analysis, we've gotten career advice, <laughs> and uh, uh, I want to uh, remind you of the advertisement. We hope to see you next Wednesday night for Beth Simmons and Ken Roth in the other venue, uh, same time but in 1501 International Affairs Building. So thanks to Catherine, our panel, and to the audience. Thank you.